Good morning, y'all. This picture right here is a guy named Robert Ballard, if you're wondering why we added him up there. Uh, Bobby B. Robert Ballard, if you guys don't know, is the guy behind us discovering the Titanic. He uh, does a lot of stuff for National Geographic, and about 20 years or so, uh, he... uh, led an expedition by by leading an expedition. It was his uh, little robots that go underwater under the Black Sea. And and here's what he found under the Black Sea. The scientist who discovered the wrecked Titanic, Robert Ballard, he began exploring the Black Sea. Uh, He said, what we're trying to do in our wildest dreams, which is exactly what happened, was find a structure that was evidence, not a sunken ship, not trash, not geology, but human habitation, and they found it. In an area submerged too deeply for human divers, the sonar instruments <clears throat> revealed details of a landscape, a rectangular area, uh, and it goes on and says, and they found tools, houses, highly polished stone. What we're looking at is a culture, thousands of years old, and then he says this, let me Let me, uh, using robot underwater vehicles more than 300 feet below the sea's surface, sea, 300 feet, they have begun to map a rolling landscape fed by meandering streams marked with houses that was completely flooded more than 7,000 years ago. I think he was off by about 1,000 years, but that was close. We'll give it to him. This is not a believer. Um, He goes on to say that while this might be seen as some for proof of uh, Noah's flood, he says this, uh, I do not claim to have found the landscape of Noah. We really can't say in any way, shape, or form that this is the biblical flood. All we can say is that there has been a major flood. And then he says this, there is proof Beyond all doubt, now this is a non-believer. This is the guy that discovered the Titanic. He does stuff for National Geographic. He has no vested interest in proving the Bible story. And he says this, a stream cut through, burst open, and at the rate of a mile per day, greater than Niagara Falls, this lake began to be what is now the Black Sea. Proof. We can't say it's Noah's flood, but of a flood. Today we're going to be talking about Noah's flood. We're in the Firm Foundation series. This is week three. We've done a creation story where we found out that God is eternal, infinite, cosmically powerful. And before before mankind ever got here, God was worthy of Worship, Not because of how he made us feel, not because of how he rescued us, not because of what he's done for us, but because of who he is, eternal and infinite. Last week, we talked about the fall. We answered the question, how could a good God make a world in so much misery? We talked about the fact that a good God is sovereign. He's patient. A good God is just, and a good God is merciful. This week we're going to be talking about Noah's flood. Noah's flood, it's really God's flood, Noah's ark. Also really God's ark. Noah just kind of went on a boat ride, but we call it Noah's flood. We're going to be in Genesis. Uh, I'll have the Genesis verses up there. If you guys want to turn to Hebrews 11. So I'm going to be in Genesis. You guys be in Hebrews 11. Somehow this is going to work, I hope. Um, And we're going to meet in the middle. So, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, start in the back, probably. Revelations, come back a few. And as you guys turn to Hebrews, I'll begin here in Genesis. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. I'm in Genesis chapter 6. And that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Remember, God had made Adam and Eve good. Adam and Eve fell, their children with them. Every intention of their 
thoughts were evil, only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But. Oh, that glorious contraction. But. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. Noah didn't earn favor. Noah didn't buy favor. Noah didn't win favor. It's not like Noah was walking around as the one guy whose heart wasn't evil continually. Noah found favor in the heart, in the eyes of the Lord. If God's worth Worshiping because he's infinite, he's eternal, he's cosmic, he's powerful, he's good, he's loving, he's just, he's merciful. Then it tells us that God is worthy of worship. Our hearts then were made to please the Lord. The question we're going to ask today, how did Noah do it? How did Noah find favor in the eyes of the Lord? And more importantly then. How do we please the Lord? If God is all the things the Bible says he is, then it makes sense that this question should be one that concerns us. How do we please the Lord? I'll tell you how Noah did it. You guys are in um, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2 says, For by it, by what? The faith. It starts off with Hebrews 11, verse 1. Remember this. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. For by it, verse 2, the people of old received their commendation. For by faith. And it specifically goes on to talk about Noah, and we'll get there in a few verses. For by faith, Noah pleased the Lord. 11.6, and without it, still in Hebrews, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. How do we please the Lord? Well, let's start with how did Noah find favor in the eyes of the Lord? Well, it was through faith. It was through faith. Going back to the... uh, Go to the next slide. There we go. Going back to this, I I don't want us to get too distracted by the word regret. You see this in the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. I I don't want us to get too spun up on this word. I want to give a a simple illustration that I think will help us with this. Um, Let's say that we're driving along and we see a road sign. We want to get to, I don't know, uh, Fresno, California. And we get to a road sign and it says, Fresno, California, that way. But the passenger says, well, wait a minute. Aren't all the other road signs green? This is blue. Well, okay, I, maybe they had a different, I don't know, maybe they didn't have green paint, but that's where Fresno, California is. Well, all the other road signs are metal. This is wood. This is just a sign that points there. Okay? And then we go up, we look at it, and we spend all day looking at this sign, and we forget to go to Fresno, California. This is the danger we run into. Moses didn't have the word to explain what was going on with God. And so, like us going, well, this isn't the right paint, and this isn't the right thing, and we completely miss what Moses is pointing to, Here's what Moses wanted us to get. We can chat about the emotions of God all day long, but here's what's really going on. God saw the world covered with water. That's how he made it. And then in a few days, he separated the water from the water. He made dry land appear. He created birds and animals, and then he gets to man. And now in a moment, God is going to, in a change of mind and action, reverse his direction. God is going to no longer, first he created man, birds, animals, all of that, out on the dry land. Now he's going to destroy man, birds, animals. He separated the waters from the waters, both to make dry land appear in the waters above the sky, from the waters below the sky. And he's going to bring those back together. And what Moses is pointing to, and this is why we can't get so wrapped up in the sign itself, Moses is saying, 
the thing that God did in creation, he's about to undo. He's going to create a flood. Commentators have spent whole books discussing this, does God change his mind? Well, we have a whole Bible that says he doesn't. Is God man that he should lie or is son of man that he should repent? No, we have a whole Bible that says he doesn't. God's trustworthy. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to regret in the sense that we do. But Moses here is saying, and don't miss this because we're so focused on the sign. Moses is saying that God is about to undo what he just did. He's about to undo what he just did. Noah had no problem believing that because Noah realized, if you guys are still in Hebrews verse 3, it says this, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are seen. See, Noah had no problem believing that God could bring the waters back together because no one knew that God had separated the waters in the first place. There is more evidence for Noah and the flood and the ark than almost any other topic in Genesis. We have more evidence of a geological worldwide flood than almost... Noah was referred to more by the New Testament writers and Jesus himself than any other Old Testament situation. Jesus referred to him in Matthew and Luke. Peter referred to him a couple times. Paul refers. We have every, like the New Testament authors believed this story. The, the geological world shows that this is true. And yet, and yet, even believers, even churches go, well, this couldn't have been a real thing. This must have been a metaphor. But here's the thing. If we know that God, Hebrews 11 verse 2, created the world with his voice, we have no problem believing that God can uncreate it. Agreed? The world that had become wicked is not the world that had been created good. The world we now live in after the flood is not the same world that was created good. Not in the same sense. See, God deals out justice and he, he pronounces a curse upon the world. And now the cosmos itself has changed in a drastically, drastic way. This is not the way it was supposed to be. In fact, I, I want to read a passage to you guys from my book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. The world as it was intended would include strong marriages and secure children. Government officials would still take office. Somebody has to decide which streets are cleaned on Tuesday and which ones are cleaned on Wednesday. But to nobody's surprise, they would tell the truth and freely praise the virtues of other public of officials. Public telephone books would be left intact. Highway overpasses would be free of graffiti. Tow truck drivers and erring motorists would be serene on inner city streets. Business associates would rejoice in the promotion of others. Newspapers would be filled with well-written accounts of acts of great moral beauty. And at the end of the day, people on their porches would call out to one another. They would read these and savor them and tell each other about them. No, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be at all. And God is stepping up to do something about it. The world had become wicked continually. The heart of every man was wicked. And you and I run into a, a problem if we allegorize this, if we make this a metaphor, we run into the problem of thinking that you and I would have been the people that got on the boat. Because we're not wicked like those people. There were grandmas that drowned that day. There were little old ladies with sweet little handbags and knitting ministries that drowned. There were Young men, there were brides, there were babies that drowned that day because the heart of mankind was wicked continually. It was an inherited condition. 
Noah had no problem believing that God could bring the waters back together because he had no problem believing that God had separated the waters in the first place. If we go on in Genesis, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms for the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. So if you've ever wondered how big the ark is, there you go. Make a roof for the ark, finish it to a cubit above the door, and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower second, make it three decks, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. All right, real quick, how big is the flood? Well, it's that many cubits by that many cubits. Um, so the cubit basically is, is fingertip to arm span, um, taking conservative measures just to make this real short. It's about a three-story tall football field. So think about football field, um, not just the 100 yards, but the goalpost to goalpost. Uh, it's a big box. It's about three stories. Uh, same cubic feet of about 500 train cars. And the, a guy named Juan Han wrote a book. Uh, this isn't the main point of where we're going today, but just because uh, we're here. He wrote a book and he said, to have two of every kind. So you wouldn't need every dog, right? You wouldn't need Rottweilers and Chihuahuas. Uh, there was probably a couple of wolves or the ancestors of the wolves and through genetics, uh, so like basically um, breeding, different DNA is, uh, is bred out, you get all these different dogs. So you'd have had two dogs. You wouldn't need lions and cheetahs and tabbies and cougars and you'd have had two, it says two of every kind, you'd have had two cats. So whatever the ancestor, maybe a saber-toothed tiger. Um, you wouldn't have needed horse and what, someone help me out, zebra and donkeys or donkeys in the, that's in the horse family, right? Okay. So you'd need two of whatever that ancestor was, and through selective breeding, we, we have species, but he took of two of every kind. A guy named Juan Han wrote a cool book, and he said, you know, they'd have only needed about half the surface area of the ark to fit two of every kind of animals that we know about today. Um, okay, so three-story tall football field. Hebrews says this about this. He says, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that, God, uh, that comes by faith. So God tells Noah, hey, it's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. It's never rained before. There's going to be a flood. We've read the book. We knew it was going to happen. We see evidence all over the world, and yet there's still people today that goes, oh, well, this didn't happen. So if that happens today, you can imagine back then they thought, oh, this isn't going to happen. But God warned Noah. Noah took the warning seriously, and through fear, Hebrews tells us, he built an ark. How do we please the Lord? Well, without faith, it's impossible. So the first thing I want to point out is faithful people fear the Lord. Faithful people fear the Lord. Noah spent zero time arguing that there wasn't going to be a flood. He spent zero time saying, well, a good God wouldn't do this. He spent zero time saying, how dare you kill millions, perhaps even billions of people? What Noah did do was he heard a warning and went, yep, okay, and he built an ark. Faithful people, Hebrew tells us, fear the Lord. And continuing on in Genesis, we see the warning that Noah, Noah heeded. He says, I will establish my covenant with you. You'll come in the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your wife's sons with you. There'll be male and female of the birds of their kinds, the animals. Take with you food. And then at the last verse, he says this. Watch this. Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. God saw the wickedness of the world. He knew it was going to destroy a flood. 
He gives instructions to one man. And now watch this. If Noah had believed God, yep, there's going to be rain. And if Noah had called his friends over and said, hey guys, there's going to be rain. If Noah had trained his sons to forecast the weather, to know that there was going to be rain, but if he hadn't built a boat, this would be the end of the story. Do you understand this? If Noah, no matter how much Noah believed God, if he hadn't built the boat, this is where the book ends. Faithful people obey the Lord. Because if Noah, next slide please, because if Noah hadn't built a boat, we would know one thing about Noah. He didn't really believe it was going to rain. We believe, and that's what faith is, faith is belief. We believe what God tells us. And if God tells us there's going to be a flood and we don't build a boat, then we don't believe there's going to be a flood. Faithful people obey the Lord. I've got two other verses. Again, we're going through 50 chapters in eight sections, right? So um, normally, I, you guys will know me, I, I go kind of verse by verse expositionally. We're kind of Skipping through. I'm, I want to skip through to these two verses here, right here. And Noah and his sons and his wives and his son's wife went with him into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And then verse 16. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. I don't want you to get the impression here that Noah built a boat. <clears throat> Boats have rudders and boats have steering wheels. What Noah built was a big box. There was no rudder because there was no destination. Noah had no idea where he was going. You want to know where else we see this word ark? This is fun. <coughs> this is fun. A little girl puts a little baby in this word for ark puts him in the Nile River and walks alongside him until Pharaoh's daughter comes out and sees him. Okay? Moses is put in what the Bible calls an ark. There is no way that baby could steer. There's no way that baby knew where he was going. But some little, well, big sister walks beside him and makes sure. Right? That's Noah's situation. His family goes in this door. God shuts him in and they float for a year. Faithful people seek refuge in the Lord. Now, I don't know what it was like in Noah's time. I don't know if people were basically the same. I don't know if, if people walked up and said, Noah, I believe it's going to rain. I believe there's going to be a flood. But are you really telling me that the only way to escape this flood is in your ark? Hmm, seems pretty arrogant to me. How about this? Do you guys remember how many, how many doors are on that boat? One. That's right. One. No, I believe, I believe your box will float, and I believe there's going to be a flood. I think your, I even believe that your box is the only way that we're going to survive this flood. But you're telling me that one door is the only way into that ark, huh? Pretty close-minded person to only build one door into this box. Guys, faithful people, don't complain that there's only one door. We rejoice that there even is a door. We don't go, well, I can't believe that God only made one ark. The fact that there even is an ark shows that this God is merciful and loving and how blessed are we that we can eat, that Noah could even go in and God shuts them in. Faithful people seek refuge in the Lord. Noah went in that door, God shut him in. You know the rest of the story. The heavens opened up. The streams burst forth. It rained for 40 days. They were in the ark for about a year. He comes out, he makes a sacrifice to the Lord and then we read this. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, 
you know, the fastest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I don't, I don't understand all the sacrificial system, but here's what I know. Noah cooked meat, God came out, and when the Lord smelled that pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Next verse, verse 6. <clears throat> Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. I want to point out two things about the, that these two verses tell us, and I'm going to take them in a reverse order. I'm not allowed to kill a man, but God could just kill millions of them. What kind of a good man, good God, would kill this many men? He brought an end to everything. Here's why we don't kill each other. For God made man in his own image. God made man in his own image. See, we're, we're going to hear the whole world's trying to tell us that we all evolved at different races, but God tells us that eight men got off a boat. And we all, you, 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 we all, some further than others, we all trace our family line back to Noah and his kids. And they'll go back to Adam and Eve, and God made man in his own image. This is why God can kill men and we can't, because when we do it, we are saying something far more transcendent than an attack on mankind. We are making an attack upon God himself. Here's my next point. Faithful people walk humbly before the Lord. God can do what he wants, and for us to attack each other is an attack upon God himself. That's why he can do it and we can't. We're all going to end this life. None of us, 100% of us, none of us are getting out of here alive. Okay? The end of a life is not what it's about. God here is saying that these people, you people, us people, all of us are made in his own image and we walk humbly before him and we don't get the right to attack something in the image of a transcendent God. Here's the other thing that tells us that first verse said that <clears throat> earth is going to remain, seed times and harvest, cold and heat. Faithful people walk humbly before the Lord. I want to show you another article. This is from the Smithsonian. If you guys can read that, it says... Uh, could Noah's Ark float in theory? Yes. And then the headline goes on to say, wow, that's kind of small. The headline goes on to say, can I blow this up? <clears throat> there we go. Basic physics suggests that an ark carrying lots of animal, car animal cargo could float, but science doesn't support other facets of the story. And here's what's crazy. They do all of the physics, all of the math, all the buoyancy laws that tons of other people have done, and they figure out, wow, this boat really is the size of our ratio of our normal cargo ships. Wow, this uh, boat really could sustain all of the life on Earth. Wow, this boat could sustain waves of up to 100 feet. And then it says nothing about which facts don't line up. None. Not one. Its headline says, but science doesn't support other facets of the Bible. And not any shred of evidence about science not supporting those facets. The whole article ends with this. It says, so yes, one boat that size really could sustain all of the different kinds of animals on the earth. And it ends with this. And because of global warming... And as the ice caps melt, and when, when the earth floods again, when we flood the earth again, isn't it good that we really can't all fit on a boat? These people do the math, and they say, wow, God really could sustain all these people on a boat. And then it throws out the rest of the story. It throws out the part where God promises that we're going to have warmth, we're going to have cold, we're going to have day, we're going to have night, we're going to have sea time, we're going to have harvest. He's never going to flood the earth again. And they say, when we flood the earth again, boy, isn't it glad that we'll have this. Faithful people walk humbly before the Lord. These people have faith. They have faith that Noah couldn't possibly be real. 
despite the evidence. <coughs> Faithful people walk humbly before the Lord. This is the last passage I want to cover tonight, this morning. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I'll remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. You remember why God brought the flood? It goes back to Genesis Go to the next verse. At the very beginning of this story, it says this. It says, The sons of men began to marry, or the sons of God began to marry the daughters of men. Now, there's a whole lot of debate about what that means. That's not the point of what we're doing this morning. But regardless of the interpretation, it says this. People began to marry each other based on who they were attracted to, not based on what God wanted. That's it. He didn't say there were rapists in the land and so God flooded the earth. He doesn't say there were murderers in the land. He says this, everyone was wicked. People began to marry who they wanted to based nothing except for on attraction and God flooded the world. And then he says this, he says, at the very end of the story, he says, see that rainbow up there? That rainbow is going to be a covenant. I'm not going to flood the world again because of who people marry. I'm not going to do it. And in nothing short of what has to be a satanic taunt, people have begun to put this on t-shirts and on flags and say, see God, you promised. You promised. You are not going to destroy us. Ha, ha, ha. I began at the beginning by saying this is not a metaphor and it's not an allegory. And here's why that has to be driven down to the core of our being today. See, if this is a metaphor or an allegory, then we're Noah sitting up in a boat looking down a three-story tall life raft at our family and our friends who are screaming and crying out there while we're safe in here. And guys, there is a time coming, the Bible says, like in the days of Noah, they will be marrying, they will be eating, they will be hanging out, and suddenly, he's coming back, and there will be destruction. But guys, today is not that day. That day has not come yet. And what that means, guys, is if we're anyone in the story, we're the people that needed rescuing. See, one man obeyed God. It wasn't us. One man, Noah, obeyed God, and he took a hammer, and he took some nails, and he covered some wood, and he made a way based on what God told him to do that floated him through and saved mankind. And our job, yeah, it's to warn our family and our friends of the terrible and swift justice. But it's also to scream from the top of our lungs, guys, there is a boat. There is a... There is a door. A guy did make a way. This story isn't about the fact that you are going to get punished. This story is about the fact that we can go in. We're not looking down at our friends. And yeah, maybe they are waving these rainbows as a taunt to God's promise. But God didn't say you guys can come in and they can't. Guys, God has not shut that door yet. And as our hearts are breaking for the people that are going, no, 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 no. That person, the person that comes to your mind right now as I'm talking, and the person that you're thinking, that person will never. Every one of us were once a person that would never. See, we're not Noah. We didn't build the boat. We needed rescuing. And God didn't rescue us because we earned it or because we bought it. Our friends and our family are no more in need of rescuing than we were. The story isn't a metaphor. It's not an allegory. It's not us and them. This story is about a God, not who sent a flood, although he did. And when he comes back, in the days of Noah, there will be swift and terrible destruction. This story is about a God who rescued. 
The story's about a God who rescued. Can we go to the next, next slide? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. We began this with how do we please the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to please him forever. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. And look at this. Not and that he punishes those who don't. Okay? That's true. But look at this. It doesn't say we must draw near to God and go to church every Sunday. It doesn't say we must draw near to God and fill in whatever your blanks are. It says this. Draw near to God and we must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's it. That's the gospel. God sent a way. We were all in need of rescuing. God sent a way. He sent one door. And regardless of how you feel about that door, you can complain about it or you can go in it. Man, and our job is to tell our friends, our family, our neighbors, and anyone that'll listen, guys, guys, there's a door and we can go in. Now, maybe, oh, last slide. I forgot this is up here. The just shall live by faith. Faithful people fear God. They obey God. They seek refuge with God. They walk humbly with God. And look at this. Once Noah had gone into the one door, once God had shut Noah in, he didn't have to be afraid of the flood anymore. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to give you peace. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Amen.